Today, we're out here on one of Edisto Island's many isolated sub-islands to investigate what I suspect is a naturalized wild population of Guatemalan indigo, Indigo ferris of Fruticosa, that has persisted since the end of the colonial era here on Edisto Island. Because of the potential sensitive nature of this population, and the fact that they're located on private property, I'm not going to say any more about the location. Just know that this is on a component island that is separated from the main body of Edisto Island, and that this island has historically experienced less agricultural pressure than other such islands. Now, before we get to the botanical surveying, I want to briefly cover the biology of indigo and the history of its cultivation in South Carolina. There were three main species of indigo that were cultivated in South Carolina for indigo dye. The least common was the native indigo, Carolina indigo, Indigofera carolinana. The species, although well adapted to our ecoregion, was never grown in significant quantity for commercial dye production. This is because Carolina indigo is a fairly slow-growing perennial, has a small volume of leaves, and those leaves contain less of the chemical precursors needed to produce indigo dye. This makes it drastically less efficient of a crop. The next least common was true indigo, Indigofera tinctoria. This species is native to the tropical regions of the Old World, specifically Africa, and was brought to the Americas during colonization. It was the species used historically for indigo production in India, Asia, and Africa. This species was planted extensively in the Caribbean and sparingly in the American colonies, but was not the dominant cash crop indigo species in South Carolina. The dominant indigo species in South Carolina, as well as much of the continental American colonies, was Guatemalan, or Anil indigo, Indigofera sofruticosa. As the name implies, the species was native to Central and South America. Its dye-making properties and cultivation were well known to the indigenous peoples of Central America, and the Spanish capitalized on the knowledge of the Central Americans to make the species into a cash crop. I assume Guatemalan indigo is easier to cultivate in the southeastern United States than true indigo due to its evolutionary origin in the Americas, but whatever the reason, it was the dominant indigo species that came to be planted on the sea islands of South Carolina. Yet, why was indigo a cash crop to begin with? Indigo is cultivated to produce a blue dye for coloring fabrics. The dye produced from indigo is also called indigo, and the shade of blue that it produces is called indigo as well. Indigo itself gets its name from the country of India, where the dye has been produced since ancient times and from where it was first introduced to the Western world. The dye is produced by cutting the stalks of the indigo plant into sections and steeping the leaves in water for a day or more. This allows the leaves to ferment, and the precursor chemicals of the dye found in the leaves of the plant, particularly the fresh young leaves, to leach out of the plant tissue and diffuse into the water. After a day or so, the leaves are removed from the water and the indigo tea, if you will, is agitated to aerate the solution. To this now oxidized solution, lime is added to raise the pH and to allow the dye to precipitate out. This solution is then allowed to settle and the water is drained off of the dye that is now resting in the bottom of the vessel. The dye is then allowed to dry partially before it is cut into rectangular cakes, dried and packaged. So what made South Carolina and the American colonies ripe for indigo dye production? Indigo cultivation in South Carolina and the American colonies was primarily the consequence of global economic shenanigans and not necessarily the result of any particular inherent merits of the region. An explanation as to why that is the case will require a bit of a history lesson. I'm no historian, nor is this my area of expertise, so I will try and be brief as I am only parroting the works of others. Historically, England got its blue dye from the woad plant. Woad was traditionally grown and processed in England. Once trade routes were established with India, indigo dye made its way to England. The woad producers felt their trade was being endangered, and they used the significant political clout of their guilds to restrict the importation of indigo into England. Over time, these restrictions lessened as the demand for indigo dye increased. Due to the trade restrictions, though, England had no established trade routes of its own and had to rely on purchasing indigo from its neighbors, France and Spain. However, as Western European nations are off to do, England then proceeded to go to war with both of these neighbors, one after the other, for several decades. After these conflicts commenced, England found it hard to buy indigo from the other empires that it was in open conflict with. So, to get her indigo fix, England turned her eye to her American colonies. By offering a bounty on indigo dye produced by the colonists, the British Empire incentivized and stimulated colonial planters to invest in indigo production and steered their exports squarely towards England, thus securing a stable supply of indigo. These are the circumstances of the global economic shenanigans that created an English market for indigo produced in the British colonies. So, how significant was indigo as a cash crop in colonial South Carolina? Indigo was never the primary cash crop export of South Carolina, at least never for any extended period of time. 
It was always overshadowed by the far more profitable venture of rice cultivation, especially Carolina gold rice. That's primarily because indigo was not a unique export to South Carolina. Indigo was produced throughout the Caribbean, the Equatorial Americas, and India, where it was much better suited to the tropical climate. These factors meant its cultivation was inherently less efficient in South Carolina, and often the dye produced in the Carolinas was considered inferior to other regions. Carolina gold rice, on the other hand, was best suited for production along the tidally influenced freshwater rivers and deltas of the South Carolina Lowcountry. Although rice cultivation required far higher initial investments in infrastructure construction and deliberate geographic sightings, the return on investment was far higher. Once up and running, a rice plantation made money hand over fist, as there was always demand for the product. In addition to the lower economic demand, indigo had two major things going against it, production bottlenecks and domestic utility. Indigo as a crop is very easy to grow, especially on the sea islands. It loves hot weather, humid air, and well-drained soils, three things we have in spades on Edisto Island. It also tolerates a wide variety of soil types, and as a nitrogen-fixing legume, will tolerate poor soils that lack nitrogen, and subsequently it can be used in rotation with subsistence crops. This makes it suitable for planting on a wide array of upland soils, and in tandem with other crops. However, the limiting factor for indigo production is not cultivation, it's dye processing. The processing of indigo leaves in the dye is a major bottleneck in the production process. Any plantation with arable upland soils could plant and grow indigo, but few could bring dye to the early market. This is because dye production required significant investment of capital into specialized infrastructure, and dye production was less distributed and modular than other cash crops. In order to produce the dye, a processing facility had to be constructed. These facilities included a well with a water pump, the various vats for each stage of the process, the structures for drying, cutting, and packaging the dye, and transportation for shipping the dye to market. On top of this, either experienced slaves had to be purchased to run the facility, or slaves had to be educated in the complex and skilled art of dye production before any dye could be produced. Additionally, the plants had to be processed as fresh cuttings, so there was no way to store or ship the indigo leaves once harvested. All dye production had to occur on the plantation, and the process had to start the same day the plants were harvested. To further compound that, the maintenance of processing facility infrastructure had to be kept up with because any delays or complications with a vat or a well could bring production to a screeching halt or ruin a batch of dye. So skilled slaves who could maintain or make emergency repairs to the infrastructure were also required to be present at all times. This requirement of highly skilled labor to run the indigo dye processing facilities presented a major bottleneck in the expansion of indigo plantations and often kept new planters from entering the market. Over time, this hurdle diminished, as the skills and designs for efficient processing became more widely known to planners. The other problem with indigo is that it had no significant domestic utility. If a trade route was blocked, if a portion of the market collapsed, or if there was a general surplus of supply, then the indigo dye left unsold in the American colonies had little to no use to the colonists. Dyes are a luxury good, after all, and the colonists had minimal need for indigo dye. The indigo plant itself was not edible, it had no medicinal properties, and it was unsuitable for livestock fodder. Its only domestic utility was as a rotation crop, which was not a common farming practice in the colonial era. By contrast, Carolina gold rice was a highly nutritious and very delicious grain that could always be sold and eaten domestically if exportation was not profitable. Despite these major drawbacks, indigo still found a sizable niche as a cash crop and made up a substantial portion of South Carolina's exports during the colonial era. Just never to the heights of the Carolina gold rice that it competed with, or the Sea Island cotton that superseded it. So why did indigo cultivation disappear from South Carolina? When the United States of America declared independence from the British Empire and entered into the Revolutionary War, England, as could be expected, stopped paying the colonists a bounty on the indigo they exported to England, and generally stopped importing indigo from the United States. This pulled the rug out from underneath the indigo plantations of the United States as the government-subsidized market evaporated. The market for U.S. indigo recovered somewhat after the war, but it was short-lived. The development of the luxury Sea Island cotton cultivar on the sea islands of Georgia and South Carolina, and Eli Whitney's invention of the saw gen for processing upland cotton, paved the way for cotton to supplant indigo as the staple upland cash crop of South Carolina. Cotton had a lot of things going for it. It too tolerated a wide array of upland soils, maybe not as well as indigo but better than most crops, and, most importantly, it produced a crop that stored very well and had processing that was easily outsourced and distributed. This meant the upfront capital investment was relatively low and anyone could plant, grow, and pick cotton at any scale. The only limiting factors were land, labor, and how far you wanted to push the vertical integration of your supply chain. This created a rush to get as much arable land into production as fast as possible 
and pushed the acreage dedicated to cotton production as far as was profitable, with Sea Island cotton cultivation reaching ludicrous extremes. At the start of the 19th century, cotton eclipsed the significance of indigo as a cash crop in South Carolina after only a few years, and scaled to undreamt of peaks of profit in only a few decades. All in all, indigo's importance as a cash crop in South Carolina lasted only half a century, beginning in the early 1740s and vanishing by the turn of the 19th century. Carolina gold rice continued to be an important player in the plantation agronomy until the Civil War in 1860. Sea Island cotton persevered until the boll weevil sapped its last remaining strength in 1920, and upland cotton, after a brief hiatus, continues to be grown widely throughout South Carolina. Which begs the question, where are these economic juggernauts of plantation agriculture today? After slowly disappearing from cultivation over the course of a century, Carolina gold rice has made a comeback as a specialty grain for culinary use. A lone enthusiast rediscovered the crop stored in a USDA seed bank in the 1980s and, through a coordinated effort with many collaborators, has re-established a market niche for the rice. I've had it, and the hype is real. It's, it's great. It's awesome. It's fantastic rice. Go get you some. Upland cotton, as mentioned before, is still grown extensively throughout the Midlands and low country of South Carolina. It experienced a brief hiatus in the middle of the 20th century until the boll weevil was successfully quarantined and eradicated from the state, but is once again a major cash crop in South Carolina. Sea Island cotton was thought to be extinct by the 21st century, long since hybridized with upland cotton and supplanted by its descendant long staple hybrid cultivars. It had certainly not been commercially grown since the 1940s. However, in 2015, the seeds of a strain developed on Edisto Island were, just like Carolina Gold, discovered by a lone enthusiast in a USDA seed bank. A small and not quite so coordinated effort to revive the cultivar for interpretive demonstration and to investigate its merits as a fiber for the modern market is taking place in the South Carolina low country as I speak, an effort, as many of you are aware, that I am playing a significant role in. I won't bore you with it today, but if you're interested, go check out my other videos on the channel. Similarly to the others, the strain of indigo grown on the sea islands of the colonial United States was thought to be extinct, but it too was rediscovered in 2014 by a lone enthusiast who discovered that Guatemalan indigo was growing wild and naturalized on Ospa Island near Savannah, Georgia. These indigo plants were known locally on the Ospa Island, but the significance of the population was not known, and because of that, their existence had never been published in any scientific journal or recorded by any botanical collection. In 2010, prior to the discovery of the Ospa Island population, a master's student at Clemson University published a thesis that reported the discovery of naturalized Guatemalan indigo plants in two isolated areas on Coosa Island in Beaufort County, South Carolina. However, being in a residential area, it was unknown whether these plants on Coosa Island were historic or recently reintroduced from Florida. This leads us, finally, to why we are here today. I believe I have located a wild, naturalized population of Guatemalan indigo of colonial origin here on this isolated sub-island of Edisto Island. If so, this population would be much like that of Ospa Island in Georgia, and only the third recorded naturalized population outside of Florida in the United States. It would also be the only known population in Charleston County, South Carolina. If my hypothesis is confirmed, the collection of seeds from this population and the propagation of this strain could provide useful genetic diversity and novel phenotypes for the further development and adaptation of the Ossipa strain to modern agricultural practices and further support the efforts of those interested in the revival of local indigo dye for small-scale clothing production. Now today, to get a better sense of how this population is distributed and structured, I'll be spending the day wandering around this island in an attempt to locate as many Guatemalan indigo plants as I can. I'll record GPS coordinates for each and collect a few seeds if I'm able. So, without further ado, let's get to surveying for indigo. Well, we're out here this morning at the survey site, and I'm just going to spend the day walking around. Uh, there's several hundred acres out here. Uh, actually, a little bit more. Well, still several hundred acres, but several hundred acres more than the property itself because it expands an entire island. But I'm just going to wander around make my way towards the two indigo sites that I know of and uh, just generally and uh, just enjoy a beautiful morning out here do some birding look for some butterflies do some wildflower watching and keep my eyes peeled for indigo the whole way uh, there's a couple of sites I want to investigate like coming up here we have a what used to be a logging deck and is now a wildlife food plot um, I have suspicions that Maybe the loggers who did the thinning uh, came up from Florida and there's a slim chance they could have had indigo seeds on their equipment. So if I find indigo all around the logging deck in 
you know, greater density than anywhere else, then uh, that's something I can't ignore. So I'm gonna go do the perimeter of this place, which has been planted in wheats and peas, and just see what we see. I'll let you know if I find anything. Well, I covered the whole north half of the island and didn't find any indigo. Found a lot of stuff that looks like indigo. You know, sickle pods, Hispania, St. Andrew's Cross, Chamber Bitter, you know, all those things that just at a quick glance look like it. But no indigo. Uh, no native indigo either. So that's reassuring, I guess. Because uh, I suspect this Guatemalan indigo probably associates um, soil and habitat wise very similarly to Carolina indigo except that it probably tolerates um, drought a lot worse so it's probably in a much more narrow uh, band of habitat than Carolina indigo but I'm expecting to find it in habitat sort of like this um, sort of drier more upland areas where there's still, a f you know, just a smidge of clay in the soil. It's still got a lot of sand, but there's a lot more available soil moisture and an open canopy. Well, we've come up on the indigo I found before. Here's the plant. Yeah, it's, it's definitely what it is. Here's the seeds. Here's the still green seed pods. Yeah, there's still a few flowers out. So, there's the stem. There's the bud. There's the leaves. That's Guatemala and indigo. No getting around that. And all around this plant there's seedlings coming up. There's another plant right over here. Smaller one. And this is in fairly disturbed area. You know, there's there's been some dirt moving going on here. So this plant may have been in the seed bank. You know, this may not be a second year plant, although I'd like to think this is probably a second year plant. That's a first year plant. These little bitty ones down here have all come up in the last several months once this one started flowering. That's my thought is that unless I can run around here in the woods surrounding this plant and find some more individuals, uh, my guess is that this plant is translocated from somewhere else on the property or it's just been in the seed bank for god knows how many decades or centuries all right about an hour and a half later went down a dead end trail had to turn around but here we are at the big patch i found and uh yeah that's all guatemalan indigo whole lot of plants just uh, right down here on the corner of this uh, culvert and really quite a culvert it's more just a drain I guess that's culvert over there but yeah more Guatemalan indigo same stuff as before I don't know how many plants are here probably four dozen so uh, I would say this has been here for years. Um, minimum two under ideal conditions, probably three, four, maybe even five. You know, or, you know, 200 years, either or. Well, there she is. Went looking all over the property. Um, didn't find any smoking guns. Uh, nothing that says to me without a shadow of a doubt that this is a naturalized colonial wild population of Guatemalan indigo. Um, far as I can tell, 
this is. Um, I don't have reason to believe that it's not, but I don't have proof that it isn't. You feel me? Um, there's still a decent chance that this came in on, you know, heavy equipment when they were, you know, doing work out here with culverts or roads, bush hogging or something, maybe mulching, you know, no idea where that equipment was before. It could have been some place where there was, you know, Guatemalan indigo planted in one of these niche uh, heirloom crop opera operations, or um, could have just been down in Florida where they're known to already be naturalized from a whole myriad of sources. So, yeah. Uh, I'm definitely going to keep my eyes peeled every time I'm out here, because uh, with any luck I'll be out here at least once a year, and uh, I'll keep looking. Um, and I'll watch this stand right here to see if you know, they start spreading, they disappear, and all that jazz. So, like this kind of thing, remember to subscribe, like, comment down below if you want to see more indigo stuff. I'm probably going to grow these uh, next year, along with the Sea Island cotton. I was growing Guatemalan indigo this year, but I had really bad germination rates. I only had one plant come up. But the plant I did have come up looks just like these guys. So, probably going to experiment with dye as well. Yeah. Time out.